I would have told you 10 years ago that this is your destiny. So yes, I would have guessed that, you know what? When Ministry of Culture eventually put something together that addresses culinary, of course, my Adabadir heads that. I get a phone call and it's a headhunter. And they call me up, they're like, oh, are you, you, may I the better dish? And I'm like, yes, and then this is me. Like, we want to talk to you about this opportunity. We can't tell you much, but it's about this and this. And we want to know about what you think about the culinary arts situation in Saudi and everything. I'm just like, okay, I have a lot to say. <laughs> Best thing I learned when I was working is, you know, they looked at me and this Saudi girl coming in and oh, you're not going to know anything. What kind of Saudi knows how to cook? You know, and I would get this comments, you know, like, what do you cook? Don't you have someone to cook for you? And then they're like, oh, you don't know this. And they showed me lentils. And I got confused. I'm like, what do you mean? It's like, you don't, you don't, have, I'm sure you've never seen black lentils. So I was like, okay, I could have stayed home for this. We have so much culture, uh, flavors, you know, and that's when I started appreciating the ingredients we had back home. Last meal on earth. What are you having? Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Welcome to another episode of the Mo Show podcast. You, you can't be. <laughs> Kick me laugh. Smile. Uh, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Welcome to, we're going to keep both of them in. Another episode of the Mo Show podcast with an old friend, Ayad Abadir. She is the CEO, let me get this right, CEO of the Culinary Arts Commission under the Ministry of Culture, Saudi Arabia. Yes. Based in Riyadh. Yeah. Four, four years. Yeah, almost four years now. Okay, so I would have told you 10 years ago that this is your destiny. Really? Yes, definitely. Oh. I know you went to school in Coton Bleu. I know you, Bleu. I know you... Um, <laughs> yes, Coton Bleu. Bleu, yeah, my French is butchered. My mom wishes that I learned the language, but I never put any effort into it. She's fluent. It's always time. Okay. It's always time. You opened Pink Camel. Yes. Even though it just started off as macaroons and now it blossomed into a full-fledged menu. I've had it in Al Ula, I've had it over here. So even though there were there were there were projects that weren't at scale, they were quality. So yes, I would have guessed that you know what? When Ministry of Culture eventually put something together that addresses culinary, of course my Adabadir heads that. Well, it was, honestly, it was it was really exciting to be offered first. Uh, I remember I was in a restaurant in Jeddah with my husband and a couple of friends of ours. And um, I get a phone call. And it's a headhunter. And they call me up. They're like, oh, are you, you, may I the better dish? And I'm like, yes. And then this is me. Like, we want to talk to you about this opportunity. We can't tell you much, but it's about this and this. And we want to know about what you think about the culinary arts situation in Saudi and everything. I'm just like, okay, I have a lot to say. <laughs> getting out of the restaurant and like telling them we need to do this and we need to do that and because you know I own businesses and I started you know in in 2012 and I remember when we weren't you know I was baking in the morning in Pink Hamel, um and then I would finish at uh, 2 p.m and then sit on the cashier and my husband and his sisters would come and friends would come and they would sell with us uh, you know the pastries so we were sold out by 5 or 6 p.m and it was amazing and it was like this rush but then we had all these different issues trying to open and find staff and do this thing and not understand, um, you know, all the different entities with um, was that to chat. It wasn't very clear for us back then. And now it changed dramatically. And it's amazing to see all these restaurants open and all these Saudis go to culinary school and study. And the ones who who just worked and learned and, you know, worked themselves up and amazing concept. I mean, I'm always in awe of, you know, the youth and the talent that we have in the kingdom. Um, and I, I I don't know, it's like all my children, I'm so proud, uh, kind of. And I remember always walking in the way I am, you know. No one has ever asked me to do anything or change anything I normally do. And I respected that a lot. And I was like, okay, I can work in a place like this. And, and everyone was so positive and supportive. And how can we, how can we let you succeed? And how can we help you? And how, you know, how, what do you need, you know? And when you look around and you're like, they're literally giving you every tool to con- to succeed. How can you not? How can you not accept that? How can you not push and work, you know, all these extra hours, you know, and, and, and still enjoy what you're doing because you're changing, you know, you're changing it for your kids, you're changing it for everyone else, you're, you're changing the country and we're changing it together. And everyone has a role. 
And uh, I remember going back and forth and I had one other friend with me on the plane. And she was doing the same thing. She was working with the Ministry of uh, Finance. And we'd be on the plane with all the husbands that were going back and forth from Jeddah. Um, and we'd come back every weekend and we'd go back and it was literally exhausting, like mentally exhausting. You were there alone in the beginning? At the beginning I was alone, yeah. You were going back? Back and forth, yeah. And uh, like so many, so many who still do. Uh, I think I did it for two years and then I was like, I can't. And you did it for two years? Going back and forth. I just want to take a second and, uh, first of all, like I, I want to recognize and salute you for not taking the easy road. The easy road would have been to just continue to live in the city you live in, grow the business, uh, scale it, and, um, you know, not take that big of a risk in moving mm. to a new city and work in government. So i got to salute you and recognize you for doing that because you took the the harder road or the road with, with obstacles. It, it was it was definitely the tougher road. Uh, it was extremely rewarding. But I think when we I started, I knew that, okay, my normal private career is going to have to, you know, hold on or wait till I finish, you know, this other career. And But it was such an amazing opportunity and such a way to change things and improve things and, you know, kind of help as much as possible and and understand what was going on and be a part of that change and you you couldn't you couldn't say no you know like I don't think anyone could say that. I don't think um I did something someone else would have said no to it it is it does take a lot um you know but I think the rewards really outweigh it um in a sense and and I never thought it was forever I always thought okay let's fix everything and then as soon as it's fixed, that's, you know, give it back to the public. That's a good yeah. attitude to have you know. because, because the old saying, nothing is forever. Yeah. And how often do we make decisions scared on, oh my God, that might be forever. No, nothing yeah. is forever. But what, no. where I was alluding to earlier was that I, I also need to recognize and point out your husband because it's rare that a husband would encourage his wife to move cities and, mm-hmm. and, and do what you did. And it's, it's always, no, how can we find a way to, to, to stay together? So it's, it's, it's very open-minded of him. It's very adventurous of him and it's very supportive like, of him, which is, but I know him. I know like him. Like now I'm second guessing. I'm like, was it, was it love or was it love? <laughs> I need some space. That's <laughs> not, not, not where I was going at all. Because I know Fersley. I know Fersley. No, on a face. So supportive. It's so legendary of yeah. him to, 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 to motivate and, and, and stand by you and support you and say, you know what, yeah, go out and do this. And and then eventually, he moved his career to the alt. Yeah, yeah. He had an amazing opportunity. He moved, you know, with the current position he had, and then he got another amazing opportunity. And it was just life. And I felt like he knew. He was like, don't, yeah. don't worry. You know, like, it's fine. You know, whatever we're going to do, we're going to do together. And and that support, and he was like, you, you know, organizing play dates and in doing everything that I was supposed to be doing and, you know, communicating with the school and everything because, you know, I wasn't there. Um, and I really thank him for that and never making me feel like, sure. you know, I am doing this and I need extra credit because I'm doing this or, you know, I was always like, oh, you know, we're interchangeable, mm-hmm. you know. Not to throw other dads under the bus, but but uh, Faisal and I, we are a rare breed. <laughs> yes. uh, we are. No, we are. We are. Yeah. Um, uh, and, and inshallah, you know, we can inspire other thought. No. <laughs> of course. Um, journey, schooling to business to where you're at now. Um, we said Cordon Bleu, we said uh, Pink Camel and, 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 and Black Cardam as well. Yeah. But what, what age did you realize that, that cooking and, and creating culinary something up your alley? So I always loved art. I loved math and art since high school. Or like painting. Art painting. And I remember... I remember always wanting to draw things and, and create. And um, when I went to, when I was applying to Parsons School of Design, I applied as a fine artist and for design management, which is a BBA. And I got accepted to both. And you have to send the portfolio and everything. And, and then I decided on design management because I could do all the art and all the math. And I loved it. And I was in one of the classes and we had, um, you know, a director or GM from uh, L'Oreal come in in Paris. And they were asking us, like, oh, what do you want to do after university? 
And one person was like, I want to work in an art gallery. And uh, the other one wants to run this thing. And one world to work in uh, Sony and, you know, product design. And and they asked me and I was like, I want to open a restaurant. What are you talking about? It's because you're not at all. Like, what are you doing here? I'm like, I don't. And I remember like literally, honestly telling them, I don't know what I'm doing here, but I'm, I'm learning about art and I'm learning all my business and finance courses and, you know, uh, game theory and whatever, whatever have you. Um, and I love to learn. And then I remember I left, you know, Parson and I went back to the Bay and I worked as a graphic designer. I was just hungry to work in anything. First time I got was a graphic designer. And then I moved into publishing. And then I moved into media buying and planning, which I knew nothing about. And I learned all about it. And it was it was really interesting. And I stayed there a few years. And I realized I would literally sneak off on my lunch break, bake something at home, and bring it back to work. And it was my de-stress kind of thing. And I'd come with cookies and brownies and th- th- whatever I could, you know, bake in 45 minutes in the house. And then I realized, okay, I'm passionate about this. I was very passionate about eating at a young age. So just, you know, thought through that. I want to also, you know, open a restaurant and feed other people. And it gave me joy. It was the idea of producing something, giving it to someone else and having them enjoy it. That simple interaction, because when you work in a corporate job, it's just paperwork on, you know, I'm booking locations, I'm booking brands here. I'm not even producing anything. I was even creating anything. So you had the designers create the campaign and I'm just literally plugging them in into space. It was just an important job, but it wasn't something that was satisfying me. And I remember, you know, getting promoted. And, and then one day I went to CEO and I was like, OK, I'm, I'm resigning. And they're like, why? But you're you're good at what you're doing. And, you know, you're getting promoted. And I'm like, it's not about being good. It's about, you know, wanting your job. I don't want your job. It's like, I don't want the CEO's job. So why am I, why am I, why am I staying? And I don't feel satisfied. I don't feel I'm con- Beauty, anything to society and doesn't have to be much it could be just you know making a cup or making some something tangible um and he goes okay i understand but if you ever need a job you know let me know and i remember quitting convincing my father you know it took me three months to tell him i want to go study cold on and not do my master's in product design in milan because that was the other option and he's like what do you mean like do your master's and i'm like no but i really want to do you know culinary arts in cold on and he's like but you can literally go to the kitchen here and like cook whatever you want. Like just, why do you need a degree for this? And I'm like, I was like, no, you need a degree. It's it's important. I want to learn everything. Like I haven't been working in a kitchen. I haven't been, you know, I need to catch up. You know, I've already, you know, I'm 20. I was like 24, I think 24, 25. And I was like, okay, I'm, you know, I'm getting older. Back then, it's like I thought I was getting older. And um, it took a few months to convince him. And then I went and I loved it. And I went thinking, you know, I'm just going to learn everything. So if I hire a chef, you know, I can speak his language. I could understand or I could help him create or do something. And then I loved it so much. I'm like, why would I hire a chef? Why am I not the chef? You know, why am I not working? And I remember them telling me, you know, like, you know, I thought school is hard. They're like, school is not hard. When you work, it's hard. And I was like, and I worked in the south of France in winter. So it's not the ideal time. Yeah. And in Gras, in a small town known for perfume, in this beautiful Rodé and Chateau surrounded by olive trees where we'd make fresh olive oil for the restaurant. And it was a two mission star restaurant. It was amazing. But because it was in Gras, we were working, I think, 15 hours a day. Wow. And my small apartment they gave me was like up the hill. And I'd walk down every day and walk up the hill at night, like exhausted sleep two, three hours and come back down. And I think I gained- Looking boot camp. No, no, I literally gained five kilos of muscles. I was chopping, because you're chopping like for hours. And we were, I think, five interns. By the third day, we were only two. Everyone like left. It's like, they're like, we're not, we're not. They quit. They quit. We're like, we're not doing this anymore. And we stayed through it. And it was amazing. Like the learning experience. And I got to do, one of my best memories is, during the bakery, the boulanger, so the bread making. And I had to get up at four in the morning. And I walked down and it's still dark in this small little town. And all I could smell was bread. At four in the morning, alone, no one else. There's nothing there. 
And I'm walking all the way down to the restaurant and the restaurant was just pitch dark. It was me and this one girl who was a boulanger. She'd put a bit of music. Um, we do the dough. So relaxing. I was going to So smoke. calm. The kitchen is dead quiet. Mm. And just the smell of bread and croissants and everything in the morning. As soon as we were done, everyone in the kitchen started coming in. And we would leave. And that was like the internship of the, the bread making. And then the, the cuisine was completely different. The cuisine was all this adrenaline rush and now and hot and show and move. And I remember one of the sous chefs screamed at me, I think in my second day, and he goes, dégage and whatever. And I wasn't even in his way, but he was just frustrated. And I remember I took it like to heart and I was like, he told me off and he was wrong about that. And I wasn't, you know, in his way and I was doing my job and how dare he, you know, and I, really stayed with me yeah, sure. and by the end of the day he goes oh let's all go get, you know get a coffee or something I look at him I'm like no he's like what's wrong with you I'm like you just told me off like how can you speak to me like this and he's like the like, oh, but that was just when we were on you know on the kitchen like don't worry about it like this is how we normally so, deal with it's it. like athletes on the field they nothing, fight nothing 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 I was just like and I was still young and I was like well I don't forgive you <laughs> I remember being upset with him for like a good week and I was there a few months. Um, is that part of the culture, the kitchen culture, the way... So the kitchen is very aggressive because also you're dealing with a bunch of knives, hot things, hot pots. You really need to be sharp. Everything is like, you have literally six people doing this one dish and everything has to be plated at the same time or else you're late. Okay. And then this gets cold and that gets it's cold. It's a temperature issue. Temperature here. thing, a timing issue. All these dishes need to go in. A lot. So it's almost like a military, a lot of precision going in. And you get this adrenaline rush and you do not feel the time go. You're just suddenly it's over. Wow. Pastry, on the other hand. Okay. Because I went to the pastry kitchen at the end and pastry was, uh, they're laughing. They're saying jokes. They have so much time. I mean, you order dessert at the end, right? <laughs> relaxed. Yeah. So relaxed. And no one cares if it's late. No. And they prep everything. So, you know, you have this, you have the souffle that they tell you ahead of time how long it's going to take. They tell you this, but... The best thing I learned when I was working is, you know, they looked at me and this Saudi girl coming in and oh, you're not going to know anything. What kind of Saudi knows how to cook? You know, and I would get this comments, you know, like, what do you cook? Don't you have someone to cook for you? And a lot of kind of like prejudice comments. And then they're like, oh, you don't know this. And they showed me lentils. And I got confused. I'm like, what do you mean? It's like, you don't, you don't, have, I'm sure you've never seen black lentils. I'm like, you know, we have the soup every day. And this was the Amuse Bush and this two Michelin star restaurant was our Hada soup that we have normally on a daily basis. It was like this unique thing that they had in the South of France. And I was like, okay, I could have stayed home for this. And then they had in the Pesach kitchen, Sagodano. Which is? And they were saying, this is Japanese pearls, which is called Japanese pearls. But Sagodano to me is what I have in Mecca, in Bed City, which is like tapioca pearl balls and you cook it with uh, milk um, you can put cardamom and then it boils and then tapioca kind of expands and you put it in the fridge and it becomes kind of the like a mahlabiya with like little pearl balls so you, had, you had a connection to both of those dishes both of the dishes and they were looking at me like you would never know this and I'm like no this is what I have in my grandmother's fridge you know in Mecca and I was like why on earth did I fly all the way here to learn how to do things I can find back home yeah. And that's when it kind of opened to me and I was like, I'm going to open my restaurant in Saudi. That I was living in the day. I was like, I'm going to open. We have so much to offer. We have so much culture, uh, flavors, you know, and that's when I started appreciating the ingredients we had back home. Because when I used to look at Sagodana, I was like, you know, it's whatever. It's, it's something that I'm so used to. And when you're used to something, you don't appreciate it. And it's only when you fly across the world, somewhere else where they're literally treating it like the best thing in the world. And you're just like, why am I not giving this enough attention? You know? And, yeah. and that was the, the aha the aha moment. Mm -hmm. What a story. You'd expect going to a place like South of France, two Michelin star restaurant. Uh, you know, people talk about that whole southern coast of France as, you know, one of the culinary capitals of the world, mm -hmm. that stretch. Um, and it didn't wow you. It did. Listen, those are amazing dishes. And what also wowed me is the amount of knowledge they wanted to share. You know, you coming in, um, being an intern, 
you know, that you're, you know you're going to work for a while and you're going to leave them. They know that. And they're like, where's your notebook? You need to write these recipes down. You know, there's no thing of the secret sauce or the secret this is take as much knowledge. You're here. You're working for literally pennies. We're not really paying you, you know. Uh, this is the payment. I'm sharing knowledge. And I think that taught me a lot because when I opened my pastry shop, I was doing the same. I was sharing everything and I had comments tell me, can you share this? Hmm. You know, how can you give them out? How can you give it to the staff? Like, what if they leave you? And I'm like, then they leave and I have to create new things. And what if they, you know, they copy you somewhere else? I'm like, well, they copy me and I have to create new things, you know, and new flavors and new recipes. Which is how it should be, right? Yeah. And you have to, you know, and I'm, I remember speaking to, there was 40 students that um, um, before I was a CEO of um, the commission, um, I was asked to speak to the 40 Saudi students that were coming on scholarship. And it's it was that passion that I've, you know, they've always wanted to do this. But, you know, society told them, no, get a proper job and get a proper career and you have to do this. So they're like, okay, we've got this, you know, for our parents. And now we want to do something for ourselves. Yeah, passion. And, you know, follow this passion. Mm. And just looking at them and hearing everyone's story is is amazing. And that they all came to that same place and we were all in that school together. Surreal. Yeah. Were you one of the first Saudis at the Cordon Bleu? I don't know. I never asked, but I was the only Saudi when I was there. Um, it tends to happen a lot, even in Parsons. I was the only Saudi in Dubai in the school I went to. Is me and my family were the only Saudis. Should the volume is higher if it's at the point where they're they're offering scholarships? Mm. It's it's certainly certainly higher today than it mm. ever was before. You're talking about forty people. Yeah, and now we're bringing Cordon Bleu to Saudi. It's like. It turned all the way around. I heard about it. Yes. Yeah. So we Were you involved? Really yes. Okay. I thought so. <laughs> yes. The Color Arts Commission. The Ministry of Culture. <laughs> Gold on Bleu. It's been announced a few times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You might exceed that. Of course, of course you were. You were, you was, yeah, you were in the picture. You did so yeah, it's, it's opening in uh, 2024 in Miss City. It's a beautiful location beautiful facility it's literally going to be one of their flagship schools uh, it's going to be amazing for the whole region um and it's amazing to see that to you know find a school and it's not because i went to the school it's just because you want that knowledge to be shared you know and and they have schools in 30 different countries and they will start showcasing saudi recipes as well because when you teach techniques you don't need to teach french recipes you're teaching techniques right so you can teach it in a Saudi recipe or a you know French recipe. I, you know, with the commission we went to a small town outside of Arla, and she was showing us how to make it heso, just date and flour mixture combined, and the way she was doing it, this woman in the middle of the desert in this house who was offering us everything you know she had, just amazing woman, and she's teaching us how to do the recipe she knows. And she was doing elbow, which is the mixture of flour and butter, which is something I was taught in culinary school. And she was doing it perfectly in the middle of nowhere. It's you know, crazy. not taught by a school because this is what they was passed down from generation to generation. And this is what cooking is it, essential. She's doing it at the level of those who practice it at the highest. Yes. And effortlessly. And it was amazing because she does this every day. And it was taught by her grandmother and taught by her grandmother and and that trial and error that you have for generations and generations and the techniques we use in cooking and, uh, you know, we smoke the bakhir, the matfu and all these different cooking techniques. It's because it was, you know, passed down from generation to generation because it was the optimal way of cooking and it, it, it turned out the best flavors. Mm -hmm. Why not, yeah. you know, capitalize on that? You travel and if you're not going to, you know, if you're not trying the Thai food or the Indian food or the Italian food, most other dishes are, bl are on the bland side. And then you try the Arabic food and it's like, wow, flavor. So I think our location and on the map is really important. You know, we were, you know, in the Middle East, Saudi, the specific location where you had the trade routes and the spice routes and the incense routes and every, all of those things. From East to West, we, you know, we got rice to Italy, you know, 
um, Ethiopia coffee beans went from Ethiopia to Yemen to Saudi. The first coffee shops was in Mecca, you know. Uh, the pilgrims that came and settled, the diversity of uh, the spices that we get, we're traders at heart. So we love experimenting with flavors. We love learning things. We love getting them back. We love recooking them and repurposing it with, you know, what we have from our land. You know, we got rice from China and planted in, it in um, uh, Hayat, in Al Al Hassa, sorry. Eastern province. Yeah. So we got rice from China and we, we planted it in Al Ahsa and it became red. And it's this beautiful red rice you get. And it's because it changed from in the land. And it's really high in protein compared to other rice. And it's the most expensive rice, you know, in the world. Because you cannot harvest more than a certain amount. And we just, you know, if you know the Arabs and Saudis, it's the idea of trying things. We're very open. As a culture, we're open to spices. We're open to so many different flavors. Um, and that helps us a lot. Um, I've seen some countries that are not open to trying, you know, different spices. They don't want anything strong. And um, and it's because of their palate. It wasn't, um, it's not educated enough. And I was reading a book about um, your the human tongue and how it's almost like your thumbprint. Everyone's tongue is different. And I noticed that in culinary school because I, we used to get judged every time we cooked anything. And depending on which chef was judging my dish, I would either increase the salt, decrease the salt, increase the spice, decrease the spice. And I would literally memorize their palate because it's perception, right? Like they're grading my dish. I want the best grades. I'm catering to this one person. How can I get the best grades? <laughs> so much harder to do than to just make one dish for all. No, because everyone has their, uh, and I, I think there's a whole notion of like, oh, don't put salt on the table. I was like, why? Certain people literally cannot. They're either smokers or something or, you know, their taste buds are bland or that they physically cannot taste the salt you yep. put in. It's not an offense, you know. You salt it to your palate if they want to add salt, by all means. But I will not increase my salt so I can, you know, please a few yeah. uh, and then harm a few. <laughs> totally. Totally. <laughs> دوامها خفيف وهش وطعمها ولا اروع. You touched on Al-Ula briefly. Mm-hmm. I was there earlier this year. It was January, February. I like going every year, especially when it's at its coldest. Uh, and we went into Pink Camel for, well, it was breakfast food, but we, we had it later on in the afternoon. Putting that together, opening a second branch in a very authentic Al-Ula vibe that you're serving dishes that is unbeknownst to that region. Like there were there were crepes. I think there was there was French toast. You know, there was French toast. There's like saffron scrambled eggs. We have marengo with steak. Yeah, we have the citrus pasta. You know, we have flavors that came from the farms. You know, uh, flavors that came from the region. But then. Flavors that you kind of want to, they were simple. You know, the kitchen is extremely small. You know, Al-Ala came about as a two-month pop-up. And we've been there for three years. And the same two-month pop-up structure. And the kitchen was, we were only supposed to open for breakfast. So it was very limited. We're like, okay, what can we do? We can do sourdough. We can do certain toasts. We can do certain flavors, eggs dishes. You know, we have our crème pancake. And then we have these French toasts. And you know, we have the citrus French toast. And... And, you know, simple things with the coffee and some macaws with the kunafa macaws and the date macaws and, and different things. And somewhere you can gather in this beautiful location, you know, surrounded by, you know, the farmlands and these beautiful mountains. And you wanted the food to be simple enough. I think each dish doesn't have more than five ingredients. You know, it's not complicated at all. Um, the eggs, the eggs. Specific. Egg, I ordered every single egg you had. <laughs> And it was such a it's such a stark contrast because you're you know, I'm I'm eating what, what I can describe as Western food in a very primitive old school Arabia environment. Yeah. With every bite I'm looking around me and I'm like, Mayad nailed it because you you just you just you brought that contrast to an area where has never seen such a thing. And it was just vibrant. It was just 
please just continue to operate it. Uh, it was think it was of expanding really, it more than yeah. more than anything else. No, honestly, it was it was really nice, and I think the people from Hayal Malikia Hakil Ala were so supportive. And the way we did it, we're like, "What do you want to eat? You know, you live here. You know, you're the one that I want to cater to. I want to make sure that you come here every day. And what kind of coffee do you drink? You know, and and what kind of teas do you want? And I love hearing the consumers. You know, I love wanting to know what what they like eating every day. Because I think in Pink Camel, we're not, it's not a fezlika, it's not high end, you know, it's it's an everyday casual kind of eatery where you go and you have good food, you know, relatable. it's relatable, it's comforting, you know, we're not spending hours trying to articulate certain things, I'm not putting too many different sauces in anything, it's very easy, things take, you know, and I like that simplicity of it, you know, just good, fresh food that you can have every day and not get bored yeah. and um you know so, so to me it's it's their their place so everyone who's in Arana I always tell them like it's your shop it's your restaurant what do you want tell us what was it was there anything wrong you know did we didn't do this dish properly or did, was it better the last time or do you think we should change this and I try to always get their comments because there are customers they're the ones who are eating there every day I'm not there I don't know how the weather is maybe you're gonna tell me you know what mad we need more dishes for the cold weather or I want more soups, you know, because it gets really chilly here and I need something comforting. Or, no, it's really hot. Let's, you know, why don't you do like um, a Saudi flavored ice cream, you know, like, you know, because we did that for a while, you know, and it was it was fun. Or maybe, no, we want popsicles, you know. Uh, you know, we're, I was, you know, speaking about, we went to Japan and I love trying new dishes and you get inspired and then, even when you try ingredients and you're like, this would be great. And, and normally when I try an ingredient, I tend to be obsessed about it for a while. And I'll put it on everything. So my household gets, you know, I, I once ordered miso paste. And I thought I was ordering a small quantity, but I didn't notice I was ordering five kilos of it. So it filled the whole fridge. And I was like, oh, I have all this miso paste. I was like, I don't want anything to go to waste. Everything became miso. So I had... um. We did um, miso glazed brisket, you know, and then I did uh, miso salted caramel ice cream, miso pain perdu, uh, miso caramel bars. Uh, did they work? Miso salmon, they they worked really well. It's that salty sweetness. Yeah, you yeah. can't go wrong. I, I did miso glazed carrots, you know, like cauliflower, you know, almost uh, mushrooms I loved, you know, like you have those. Japanese mushrooms, the longer ones, and you can just leave them as a bunch and saute it with, you know. This can inspire a new dish. You can... it was, so I did a bunch of dishes and, and it's just amazing. And then I went to my yuzo phase and I went to all these different things and you have like, if I'll try anything, dukka, you know, I made dukka popcorn, I made dukka, like, you just get inspired about this one ingredient that suddenly can change everything and your perception of it. And when we went to Japan, I was obsessed, it was hot, and I was obsessed about trying shaved ice. The concept seems simple, you know, like you get ice, you shave it, and you put it, like, flavors on it. And it was very popular, and I was like, I just want to try it. And my husband wasn't really interested in trying shaved ice. Like, we're in Japan, you know, let's try fish, let's try something else, let's try the ramen. I was like, yes, we're going to get to all of that, but I need to try this before we leave. And, and it was literally the last thing we ate there. Uh, but has we finally found a place that was was open, mm -hmm. and we had a shaved ice. It was orange, orange juice. And I think they they freeze the orange juice and they shave it, and it was fresh. And it was just that texture. It wasn't like snow because I remember eating snow as a child. It was much more thinner and delicate and stilling. Like you're eating something, but you're melting in your mouth. And are they known for that there? Yeah, they're known for that. And to me, I'm like. I want to do this in, with Mystica. I want to do this with, you know, pistachios. I want to do this with pomegranates. I want to do with everything. You know, like you start getting these ideas of why don't we expand this? And now I want to open a shop that's only shaped ice. <laughs> and that's what travel brings, you know. It, it, it opens your horizons and your and your creativity to to start something like opening a shaved uh, ice <laughs> place that is that just does that, that's pomegranates or pistachio favors. Uh, traveling really just yeah broadens your horizons I think it's amazing I think culture is the way we consume food right um, no 
the opposite, actually. Food is how we consume culture. Correct. And because food is how we consume culture, then it's the best way to showcase a land, a heritage, um, yeah, a country, an experience. And now you have these beautiful Saudi restaurants open all over the world, you know, and whether it's a Saudi concept that's making falafel or different things or whatever they want to make, or if it's a Saudi restaurant, you know, that's open abroad. I mean, we just had participated in Taste of London and it was beautiful. And we had a Saudi booth and we had one of the participants with us, the chef, has a Saudi restaurant in London. And it was amazing because we were introducing Saudi food to the British, to the public, and there's international kind of crowd. A lot of them have never tried Saudi food in their lives. And they loved it. What did you make for them? Um, we had mtabak, we had mergouk, we had jarish. Uh, mento. No, we didn't have mento. We had kleja, uh, dugimat. Uh, dugimat Saudi. Always Saudi coffee. Mm. Uh, dugimat Saudi. Um, um, can feel mendi. Come on. Sign me up. Uh, it was it was amazing. And the you know, the the lines and the cues and the curiosity and the there's always this kind of surprise look, you know, oh, it's really good. And I had that the most in France. You know, we had events in France and the French were particular about their, you know, food. Watch. And I think they were being nice to me and they're like, Okay, you know, like we'll try this. And then she took a bite and then she looked at me, she's like, Monsieur Bon. Like, it's good. Like, and I didn't know whether to get insulted or a compliment because it almost sounded like I was expecting edible and this is actually pretty good. And then she asked for a second and third plate and I was like, okay, she did really like it. And I still was a bit kind of held by, like, was it a compliment? Yeah, <laughs> was it was until today. <laughs> was it until Sorry. today? I was like, I was like, well, at least it became a compliment, yeah. you know? And then they're like, where is the Saudi restaurant in Paris and where can we go eat and where can we do this? So. It's something we're also working on. Like, how can we increase the Saudi restaurants internationally? Because people want to eat. Everyone who's came and, and ate and visited, like, the thing they go back with is the food, the lamb, the rice, the this, the spices, the, you know. And we want them to have access to it on a daily basis yeah. internationally. You can't beat it, honestly. Moroccans did very well with exporting their cuisine. New York, London, some of the biggest cities in the world have very good Moroccan restaurants. They love that whole couscous vibe, sitting down, big plate, kind of like how we yeah. do. So they jumped the gun 20, 30 years ago and, and it worked out for them. You know, it's amazing. And I think the more chefs come to Saudi and discover, because to me, it's, um, you know, we invite chefs all the time. And to me, it's it's like a kid in a candy store, right? You have all these ingredients you want to discover and all these new paints for a painter you want to paint with. And for a chef, that's what you want. You want to get inspired. So it's always a call out from me to chefs internationally. It's like, come, let's inspire you. Come discover the culture, discover the cuisine, discover the different cooking techniques, discover the flavors and ingredients, a lot of which you've never tried before. And when they come and they see that, and I see the look on their face and they're like, okay, you know, you got me. Yeah, you have something here. You have something, yeah. you know, it's, it's, um, and they literally, they always tell me like, we're coming back. And some have come back on their own, on vacations with their wives, you know, and like, oh, we're just here on vacation, but what was the fried fish, you know, <laughs> yeah. we ate last time? The fried nasha, you know, like, yeah, that's a staple. Good yeah. like, what was, you know, when we ate, you know, here, I want to take my wife to go see it or my kids. Mm, they love that. And it's it's amazing to see that. And it's, um, I don't know, it makes my life really easy because to me, it's, you have such an amazing population who are so welcoming, always smiling. You know, you don't have to teach them how to be hospitable at all. You know, we go above and beyond. And I think we take it for granted. We don't realize, you know, the people don't realize how amazing it is to be in a society that's so warm and welcoming. And we had, you know, two international um, um, guys come in who have their own company and they were evaluating the tourism and kind of food to culinary tours in Saudi. And like, Bayada, you don't understand how easy it is to do culinary tours in Saudi uh, compared to other countries. I was like, why is it? Because we don't have to teach you to smile. We don't have to teach the five-year-old kid how to be welcoming and offer water. I mean, I came here, your son offered me water and, you know, made sure we had everything we had, which is amazing. He's, he's six. It's a standard thing we have that we overlook. And I, it, it's something that we should really be proud of. 
use it towards our, our advantage. You're right, because these things are often taught in other cultures. And for us, they just look at, our kids look at us and they see how we go about our yeah. business. Uh, you know, kids are always watching you. And when you're hospitable, it's something that just becomes part of their DNA and the way they operate. Mm -hmm. So using that as leverage to uh, to, to apply in areas that uh, are of culinary um, is, is a place that uh, is time well spent, honestly. I wanted to ask you about the um, the book, the hardcover book that you put together. We It was like almost like a call out to all Saudis to upload their family recipes and stories. And they did. And they uploaded these beautiful recipes and stories about how, you know, they learned it from their mother or father or she used to cook it. It's a grandmother who's talking and she learned it from this and they used to cook it and they used to bake it in, in the, um, the bakery of, you know, in Hara because they didn't have an oven in their house back then. Um, one girl was talking about how she would make this dish for her for his father because it reminded him of her mother who passed away and she learned it from her mother and every time she bakes it for her father, kind of tears up and he misses, you know, the wife who passed away. Beautiful, beautiful story. And it's, it's basically a window to Saudi homes. You know, they're not professional chefs. They're cooks that have been cooking this dish for generations and generations which to me sometimes is even better. Uh, so you really get the authentic recipe. And we sent a photographer to their house uh, all over Saudi. So these people come from all over. And the pictures are literally in their house. And they were cooking the dish, so it, nothing is stylized at all. It's literally like the truth, you know, served on a plate. It's those dishes, those recipes. And it was an amazing. It took a year and a half almost to finish. The team worked so hard on it. It, we were published in three languages. We launched uh, it with English, Arabic, and French. Um, there's another country that wants to publish it in their language now as well, which is amazing. And it won two awards in the Gourmet Book Awards, one for best um, hosting book and best uh, Arabic culinary book of, in the world. How many recipes in the book? 30. 30 yeah. recipes. Yeah. And this is like homemade recipes that have almost been lost over time. So they're they're not lost. So thank God we preserved them. Um, could have been lost if you didn't. Could have been lost, but it's it's so nice because it's not just a book with recipes. You have stories. So you have the history of this dish. So how old is this dish? And then you have the story of the person who gave this recipe. And then you have a story of the ingredient. You know, so the different it's, it's the chapters were by ingredients. So you have rice, lamb, dates, wheat, uh, cardamom. And so we didn't do starters, main courses, or it was literally by recipes. It was a beautiful book. Um, and we're so proud of it. We're proud that it won, you know, two awards, you know, compared to, you know, hundreds and thousands of books, you know, submitted for this award. And it was just an honor. And for everyone who was involved and all these cooks, you know, that uploaded their recipes and preserved their, you know, their heritage in a sense. It's like a time capsule. It's amazing. And then after that, we, you know, we did the codification project where the researchers were traveling across Saudi, documenting recipes, old folklore. It's, it's amazing what they're doing. And we documented over 1,200 recipes for Saudi. We're almost finished. And the amount of knowledge we documented is priceless. And, you know, we have sausages. We have so many different things that I've never seen before and dishes I've never heard before. And we keep discovering and it's amazing to see and to have that. And, you know, they're going to be into this like 13 book volume of like almost encyclopedia for each region. So, you know. Each region is so different from the other. So different. And it's because of the landscape, because of what grows there. Uh, you know, even their taste buds, when you look at Saudi coffee, depending on which region you are, they change the spices. You know, in the south, you have cinnamon and ginger in the Saudi coffee. and the center, it's saffron and cardamom. Uh, the roasting changes. Uh, and it's beautiful. It's beautiful Maybe. to travel across Saudi and eat from all the different areas and, and see the diversity we have. Yeah, it's special. I remember one time, and I'm also not being afraid to say when you did something wrong. You know, like if you did a mistake, yeah, I'll up. apologize for that. I remember one time I I, uh, I did something and, and I didn't notice. 
And because I'm a bit, I'm very casual with everyone. I don't have the, um, I have to be reminded of certain protocol, you know, like, okay, you address this person this way. And I tend to write things down and okay, you know, get it straight. And I remember speaking to someone in a department and I didn't know what position she was in. You know, to me, we're, we're the same. I'm the CEO, but it's fine. And really upset about something. I was like, oh, this was, you know, this was a disappointment and we should have done this and we should have done that. And and I, I really don't understand why this was done this way and everything. And and then I got, you know, her head, you know, call me up and say, may I don't, you know, like, why did you speak to her like that? She like, you know, she was, she was devastated and, you know, she's a junior and I had no idea. And I was speaking, because if I spoke to him, it would be fine. He'd be like, oh, you know, but we didn't have enough time or we, you know, it was been fine. But she felt like she was being scolded because I'm at a position. And I think that's what people forget sometimes. And I forgot. And I was like, I was like, you're right. I was like, I'm so sorry. And I called her back up apologizing. I was like, I'm sorry I spoke to you that way. It wasn't about you. It was about the situation. And you know, I meant the situation, you know, should have been held differently. Not you, not you personally. And and now I'm very particular when I when I say something negative or not negative, but I was like, we need to fix this or we need to do this. I was like, the situation and I, I address it again. I'm like, I have nothing, you know, you're you're doing a great job. <laughs> but like this situation, because people get sensitive. You don't know how many hours they've been working on something. And and even if everything went wrong, you know, it's still time they took out of their day and they tried their best. Be mindful. And be yeah. Uh, and and sometimes you forget that. You're you're caught up in so much work and you, all the things you're doing and you forget that you know this person also has a million things on their mind and family and yeah. obligation and that one word you might say might make their day or break their day you know yeah, yeah. so be conscious be conscious of how you say things yeah. i think was my biggest lesson totally i'm gonna get a glass of water and then we're gonna get into some deep hard-hitting questions mm -hmm. this is where it really starts What's something that bothers you in today's culinary world or industry? Hmm. The the fact that I can't eat everything that I see on Instagram. <laughs> like it probably bothers me a lot. Some things look really good. And you're like, just want like to, at least either give me the recipe or let me know where to go and eat it. <laughs> it's, give me a solution. It's become for my quite, suffering. It's be it's become quite a career for these Instagram chefs who want to make a name for themselves. Yeah, so I think I think there's a whole platform for culinary entertainment. You know, like seeing someone cook, seeing some that one do different things or design a cake. Um, but I can't judge an image, right? I, I I can judge art, like or the art of you know making a beautiful cake or a design or anything. But I can't judge the taste. And I think a lot of times they'd give me these Instagram um, of all these different chefs. And they're like, we want to hire one of these for something. I'm like, but to cook? And they go, yeah. I'm like, do they have a restaurant? They go, no. Can we try their food? Uh, no. Then how can we pick? I don't know if they're good. Based on it's pictures? A, based on pictures, based on Instagram. For, so it's a bit frustrating. So to me, I, I just, I really want everyone to have an outlet or something it doesn't have to be big something small where or do events or something where we can taste your food and enjoy that and share and and you get that interaction with people because if you're cooking sometimes just cooking and taking pictures you don't have that interaction you need someone to try it you need someone to tell you i have my daughters and my son tell me mama this is not good like i don't know what you did I'm like what kind of experiments you did today wasn't great and then sometimes they're like this is the best thing in the world and it makes my day and, and and they're right sometimes I do try to experiment something and it turns out completely horrible and I'm like well and then I have to explain to them I'm like this and there wasn't flour so there wasn't this but there was this you know coconut powder and there was a bit of almond powder and then I had to put some of this because there wasn't enough of that and they're just looking at me like we're not impressed yeah they're not so you know they're not sold 
Are they typically like your first line of guinea pigs uh, in terms of those who try your uh, creations? Yeah, them and my husband. And they're brutally honest. Good. Like they're, <laughs> and they keep you very grounded, you know, because they're not going to sugarcoat it. I think I had, I told my team, I was like, you know what? I want to, I want to prank the commission, like my commission. I want to prank the young ones. And, uh, you know, the GM and, and everyone with me were like, what do you want to do? I'm like, what if I cooked something horrible? And I told them, put little, like, that's how it is. <laughs> but it's horrible on purpose. And you have to say that it's amazing because if you say as a director, like, then they're going to think, you know, yeah. oops, <laughs> oops, we cannot, you know, say anything bad. And and watch them eat this horrible food. And I was like, I'm not going to waste food like that. I was like, this is not. The, the idea was The idea good. was pretty good that yeah, I was yeah, like, what, when would they stop? When would they stop and tell me, I'm sorry, Beata, but this is horrible. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know how you're a chef. <laughs> it's like the best prank ever. Um, and But then I realized everything we do, there is a food revolved around it. There's a dish. There's a certain thing like mamul for eat. And, and uh, you know, um, what do we eat in Ramadan? All of it's moves around the food. Shorbet uh, hab, you know, it's, those memories, you know, those childhood memories, it's not just our culture, in all cultures. How do we celebrate? The first, you know, simple celebrations were always about food. Yes. We're going to cook a feast or, you know, hajj, lam, you know, but what is it? What's it going to be? What are we celebrating? And it's amazing to see that. I think I want to go back to that simple kind of where it meant something, where you didn't have lam every day, but you had lam, you know, for hajj, you know, where you had it for certain occasions where we were more mindful about what we ate and when we ate it because if you eat something every day it, it, it's no longer it's not interesting anymore it's yeah. not special it's not you know um, totally and you want to be more mindful about what you eat you want to make sure that it's special you want to make sure that you know even for kids this whole eating and not remembering what you ate uh, you know just putting things in your mouth is, is, is wrong because then they overeat and they're not mindful um, I always ask my kids, I'm like, what did you have for, for lunch in school? What did you have? What did you eat here? And, and you can see when they're excited about it, they're just like, today there was this and it was cooked with this. And they'll describe the food and the sauces and, you know, all the different things. And, and some days they'll say, it's like, no, it wasn't that great. And, you know, we didn't want to eat and we didn't want to do this. And, and, you know, I, I miss this dish and why don't we cook this? And I make sure that I don't cook things all the time. So it's for a special occasion. And then they get so excited about it. And it's those simple pleasures, you know. Uh, totally. Yeah. If sambusas were throughout the year, it wouldn't be so special. We wouldn't love it as much as we do. No. And when I say sambusas, I mean the triangular fried meat. That's a specific one you want. That, no, that's, for me, that's my grandmother's house. And that's mm -hmm. all that me and my cousins eat today. We have the same thing. My husband's house has the buff, which to me is a, um, for everyone who loves the buff, great. To me, it's a form of sh hollow dough, and they have three pieces of meat. Like it has to kind of rattle. Not enough, right? And I'm all more about the protein than the carbs. Yeah. So I'm like, but the ratio doesn't make sense. The ratio. Like I can't justify eating the sambusa because it's more carb. Definitely. It's too much guilt. Although I love it, but the way they eat it is almost like a scoop for yes. the soup. And then when they did that, I was like. Okay, now I get it. Yeah, yeah, it like makes sense. Now when you do it like that, and that's why you want an empty, like the whole experience made exactly. sense to me. And I'm like, okay, you yeah. have something. Yeah. You know what's funny? When we get married, we see how other families do it. Because my wife's family were into the buff, I call it crescent, whatever. Uh, and I was like, oh, okay, so this is how you guys do it. And then when she comes to my grandmother's house, she'll have the triangular, and she never had it. And today... Like it's her favorite sambusa. Yeah. Yeah. She's like she's like I won her over in that. Yeah. But I couldn't get her to dip it in ketchup. <laughs> like, okay. We, give it straight. Babe. We did. Why do you dip it in ketchup? Oh my god, ketchup and Tabasco, which is where we dip our sambusa. It just works if you think about it. Fried meat, those things kind of go with with the sweetness of. Yeah, ketchup. you could do it. You could do a burger sambusa. Add some cheese and dip it in. We, we might have something here. On the subject of burgers, you know what really makes me proud? Like if you were to take the, the best 
burger gourmet restaurants from the States, the people who have invented burgers. Could be five guys, it could be Shake Shack. Okay? Yeah. What is amazing to see is that a Saudi brand, a Saudi burger brand, and I'm going to name them because it's my favorite, Section B. I love it. Trounces, like obliterates Five Guys or 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 um, Shake Shack uh, to the point where, I mean, I'm, I'm here comparing it with some of the best in the world. No, no, we have amazing, amazing concepts. I think it's it starts with the knowledge of, it's a skill to know how to eat and to understand good food and good flavors. I think Saudis really do know that. Um, especially the ones who want to open a restaurant. Yeah. They know taste. You know, they'll try their burgers. I'm like, okay, this is up to a standard. This is not up to a standard. And I think having that palate is something sometimes you overlook. I remember when you when you open, when I opened Binkau Mall, I was doing these simple cheesecake jars. You know, I was like, okay, I was just going to do this. So it's like you grab and go and obviously the weather is hot. So how can I? It was more of a practicality thing. And they were so popular. And then other cons- other restaurants were, were doing the same. And to me, it was, and I remember people telling me like, this person's copying you. And I'm like, that's the biggest compliment I could get right now. I was like, it's a huge compliment. And I was like, you know, I make croissants. Everyone makes croissants. We're not copying. It's, it's you're, you're adding things. I, I didn't create the jar concept. I mean, I'm sure it was there before I started. <laughs> I was like, so... The whole thing is like, oh, they're going to copy this dish. I was like, it's a compliment. I was like, all dishes, you cannot patent a dish. As soon as you do a dish, and I remember giving the recipe out to anyone who asked, because they're like, this is Anna and Shargiya, and you know, I can't come to Jeddah, and I really miss your, you know, this dish and this cheesecake jar, and I really want you to tell me how to make it. I was like, okay, great. Do you have a pen and paper? She's like, you can give it to me. And I'm like, yeah. Like you're, you're in Shadgi and you really want to make it. Like, why wouldn't I give it to you? I could publish a book now if I wanted to, if I had time and give you all the recipe. Why not? And they asked me about the macaws. They asked me about, I was like, take, take everything. People guard their recipes more. You don't. But if you guard, you stop your creativity. You stop at a certain point. You're not going to improve. And that's where things get stuck. Um, and certain countries are very known to do that they just want to focus on one thing one secret sauce one this one that and they stop and they stop innovating but you have to always innovate and you have to you know spread knowledge and if you look at these amazing chefs as soon as they create something new a new technique you see them post about it and they show you the recipe and they'll give you how to do it and it doesn't make you stop going to the restaurant it doesn't make you them stop going to their bakery and buying you know the dish but it's that whole spreading knowledge and the more we do that, the more we improve, the more we grow. Because I might give you a recipe and you're like, oh, this would be great if I combine it with this other thing I was doing. And then you create something new and you post that. And then this becomes something else and this becomes, you know, something else. And and the whole landscape of the color arts changes, you know, and suddenly we're doing this amazing thing and it goes into space. <laughs> Why not? We do space too. Yeah, quite literally. That's pretty cool, actually, how the two Saudi astronauts that were up in space two months ago, less than that, a month ago. Um, they served Saudi coffee up in space. It was amazing. They had Saudi coffee and they had dates. And they sent me, you know, they sent me the video. And I was ecstatic. I was like, I couldn't have wished for a better way to spread knowledge on Saudi cuisine than having it consumed in space because these astronauts really wanted to enjoy their cup of Saudi coffee and dates. It's got to be a first. <laughs> to be in the space. Then. I remember telling them when I met them, by accident on a plane ride back from London and they're on the same plane I was like you need I was like first thank you for that I was like oh, thank you for your service obviously but really thank you for those two <laughs> yeah. things that's where I got that you posted that's where yes. you made my life very easy at this point and please let me know how we can help you if you ever go in space and, and maybe I'll make you should be sure <laughs> that's something that's good to kill, but um, it was very nice of them and I think just taking a little piece of that culture because to be honest, that's what you miss the most. And I remember I tried to cook, uh, you know, make Saudi coffee when I was studying in Paris and I was homesick. And I called my father and I was like, how do you make Saudi coffee? And he's like, let me call you back. I'm, I'm busy. It turns out he called my mom. He asked her how to do it. And then he called me back, but he couldn't tell me, like, he didn't know. <laughs> so he calls me back and he goes, okay, so you need 
you know, three cups of uh, Saudi coffee, uh, you know, and one cup of cardamom and you grind the cardamom, you roast the Saudi coffee, it has to be green grains and you roast it till it's golden and then you grind everything, then you boil this and you boil that. But he didn't tell me the quantity of water. And I remember spending the whole day in Paris trying to look for green coffee beans because they don't have that. They just have roasted yeah, different, you know. And I remember finally finding one coffee shop and they had bags of green coffee beans as a decoration item at the front to show you this is how it normally comes from the tree and then we roast these beautiful coffee you know beans and i was like i was trying to buy their uh, prop like <laughs> the, the, the display prop yeah. and and they're like but this is not for sale i'm like no no but i need it and i made i spent an hour speaking in french explaining to them why i need to take this home and roast it myself mm-hmm. till it's golden brown and grind it and I think he just wanted me out of the shop and he was like, okay, 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 just here, you can take a small bag. And I remember roasting like this much coffee and putting it in a della with this much water, which is insane. It was black. It was black coffee. Ooh. It was so, so concentrated. It had the same smell. It smelled amazing. And I still drank it. No way. <laughs> For you didn't sleep that much. I was, I was so homesick and it just smelled like yeah. home. Yeah. And the smell yeah, just takes it back. Um, now we have, you know, Khabir and Gahwa, which is like the coffee expert, and you have a license to be a coffee expert. And they teach you how to roast it, how to do it, to finish it, all the whole preparation. And it's amazing to see that and to see the pride they take in it. And you have women and men do it, and they can get the license as well, and they can just apply online, and they go for the test, and it's, it's amazing. Um, I wish I knew that. I right. wish I had that back then and like, applied for the license. Yeah, knew yeah. how to take Saudi <laughs> coffee. It would have made life easier for you. Yeah. Um, last meal on earth. What are you having? Honestly, I, I don't care what I'm having. If it's my last meal on earth, it's who I'm having it with. Ooh. And I would, all I care about is having my whole family, close friends, on the table and probably chewing extremely slow to make this the longest meal possible. Uh, but yeah, but I mean, it could literally be tamis ma zata rosette, or it could be an amazing, you know, course meal. Or it, it, honestly, in Jama, the, the people you spend your time eating a meal to me is so important. Um, and you'll you'll notice this. You'll notice when you travel, you'll eat a meal and you're like, oh, I wish this person was with me. I wish you can try this. I wish, you know, my wife or my kid or my brother or someone, you know, was here with me or my sister. And, and that creates memories because even if it's the worst meal possible, if you're with the right group of people, you are going to be laughing about this meal and remembering it. And those are sometimes the best meals, ever, even if it's the worst. Yeah. And it's it's amazing to have that. Nothing like it. Nothing like it. A good group and good food. Yeah. Um, what do we need more of? Laughter. What do we need less of? <laughs> Judgment. Oh, deep. Very judgy these days, the world. I, I, I don't know if it's this knowledge is available for everyone and you're assuming the knowledge you get is right and the information you're getting is right. So you're making these decisions and you're making these judgments to others. I mean, I spend most of my day telling that, you know, telling people that you listen, you don't know what, you know, this person's going to, or you don't know what else they have on their plate, or you don't know, you know, if you think they're not doing anything, then you could be completely wrong and they have the whole world on their plate or they, you know, and trying not to be judgmental and, you know, I think it's the most decent thing to do. And sometimes we forget that. We 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 don't have time, so we go into straight, you know, um, opinions on things. I think if people were more open to other people's, you know, what they're going through, um, and yeah, as you said, put yourself in that person's shoe, you uh you you wouldn't be so judgy. Yeah. Uh, less judgments. Wow, good one. Last night at, at around midnight, just before I went to sleep, I went on my iPhone and I went to screen time. And I wanted to see how many hours am I spending on my screen and more specifically on which apps. And number one was Instagram. 
Mm. And it was just just shy of, I'm so embarrassed. But look, I mean, I'm on my Instagram because of the podcast. It's because your of the, work. It's your work. You know, but still, yeah, the two hours a day is just something I couldn't justify. Two hours a day. It was just shy of that. One, Honestly, two, I don't know how long I spent. But I, I... Well, let's find out. I, sh- I should find out. And, but and, and I was like... Um, sorry, go on. No, you. You're not one. Go ahead. You know, that addictive personality kind of trait. You get addicted to things. I remember I had that with Candy Crush ages ago. And it was this game that you just kept something. And then I remember getting frustrated because I was, I felt like I was addicted to something and I just deleted it on the spot. Good. And I have a personality where I don't like being addicted to something. So if I think I'm always doing something, I just stop it like cold. Uh, Cause I feel like it has power over me. So if I do that with Instagram or anything, I tend to just shut it off. It's very powerful to be. Just because I don't like an addictive personality. Um, I've seen it on people and I I think I fear it a bit. It's dangerous. I don't like having something in control of me or like, you're not going to tell me when I'm going to sleep. I'm going to sleep now. <laughs> you're not going to tell me I'm going to scroll this for like 20 hours and and because you go nonstop and then this becomes this. And, and I realized my attention span is much shorter. So even when I watch a series, so now a movie is really long. I watch a series. Although some episodes are as long as a movie. I will fast forward a series sometimes because I want to get the zoom down. <laughs> like I want to get it. And I, and I guess it's because I don't have time and I want to sleep at a certain time. And, you know, I've only had like 10 minutes to unwind and I need to do this. And um, yeah. And then I realized when I was fast forwarding a series, I'm like, but this is entertainment. I'm supposed to sit and watch this and, you know, respect the cast and crew and everyone who's on this because it's a form of art. And I just stopped. I just turned off the TV. I'm like, listen, if you don't have enough patience to watch a full series because the director and everyone decided that this is a journey you should go on, then you should not have the pleasure to watch it at all. You know, and you should turn it off and move forward because I think we're trying to experience so many things in such a short period of time that we're not even enjoying any single one of them. And that's to me when you have to just shut off everything. And, and I know why you do that, by the way. Why? Because you'd rather be creating than consuming. Maybe. I started knitting again. I knit now. <laughs> See what I mean? I knit. With, with my wife, when we're watching a show, and I'm just not into it. We're watching Severance. I couldn't buy into it. She's like, you're not into it. I'm like, I, no, I'm just not into it. It would have to take a really good show yeah. for me to, to give it my time or else I need to review episodes. I need yeah. to work with my editor on stuff. So all of a sudden with the creation of this podcast, I find myself being a creator for the first time in my life. Mm-hmm. So if it's not something amazing that I'm consuming, if you're not an amazing restaurant and you're enjoying it, you would rather be working on a dish. Yeah, anything else. Yeah. That's true. And we only have so many hours in the day, so we want to be like, um, you know. No, and, and the older you get, I don't know if it's the age, but you get very picky with your time. Correct. You know, you you socialize at work. You have to socialize at work. You're smiling at everyone. You're doing this. You're doing that. As soon as I get home, I'm very picky with the people I hang out with or the who come over or, you know, I want people to come over with their pajamas at this point. Yeah. You know, I do really stay time. Like, we need to be comfortable enough that you come over with your pajamas. We sit. We talk. We discuss whatever we want to discuss. So, you know, we have some laughs because we need to laugh a lot more. True, true. And, and just enjoy ourselves normally with... Nothing, you know, no makeup, no, no formalities. No formalities. And, and I remember when I moved to the other, I was like, oh, I need my pajama people friend. <laughs> like, I'll take them over. <laughs> you touch on laughter a lot. Is it something that you felt that you needed more as you aged or throughout your life you were pulled into humor? I, w- I used to laugh a lot more when I was younger. You didn't have this stress. You didn't have all this responsibility. You didn't have to worry. And then lately I realized, you know, when I started laughing, I, I was in a situation where we were laughing so much. I realized, when was the last time I laughed like this? You know, and I was like, I don't remember. I used to laugh like this every night. Till your stomach hurts. Till your stomach hurts, till you can't anymore. And you're just energized and you're, you know, and now I always try to make my kids laugh where they, they make jokes or tickling them or something because that's how important it is. It's honestly a de-stress. As soon as you're laughing, you're de-stressing. Your everything is kind of back to zero. 
And we don't do that enough. I think we take ourselves too seriously. We don't want to laugh about anything. Um, you know, and it, I, I miss it. It's, I generally miss laughing. So if anything makes me laugh, I laugh. You know, I'll, 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 I won't hold back. I'll just laugh out loud. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like at 2 a.m. In, uh, in, 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 in the office when you... We've done sprints. You know, we've done races in the office where we had to like, and I won. <laughs> <laughs> Good to hear. But yeah, I think... I think it's important and it's important who you spend your time with and it's important and that handful of people, you know, that inspire you, that lift you up, that make you the best you. I think I remember meeting my husband and we were talking and and I always had this view of, you know, I never really fell in love and I was like, I don't know if I'll, I'd fall in love or get married to someone I love, but I thought, okay, you can end up, there's so many people you can end up with, you know, like you could get along with this person and that person. And, you know, you, can, you have so many friends, it's kind of like the same thing. And um, I remember falling in love with my husband and knowing he made me the best version of me, you know, and knowing that, you know, if I was with someone else, I'd be a different version of myself, you know, maybe I wouldn't be in this position. Maybe I wouldn't be this person and be, you know, as a more insecure person because whoever I was with was making me insecure or was not pushing me enough or um, did not understand that I have a huge ego if I need to like this right now and then. But it's, it's amazing to see that when you understand that, yes, you could marry anyone, but it's who really makes you the best version of you and you need to do the same thing for them. The chemistry. Yeah. And, uh, and knowing that and knowing that you have this partner that that pushes you and and makes you uh, challenges you and isn't afraid to tell you that no you're wrong or you know you should have done this or or um you know this would have been better you know that that critical kind of advice that okay sometimes you don't want to take like you don't want to hear that sometimes but you do because you know they're right and you know they mean well and you do the same for them that honesty i think is is amazing to have and and when you get older you really appreciate that with not just your partner but with your friends as well those are the ones that care yeah and you don't want friends who are just there like a couch you know sitting there you want them to add value you want i want to learn something from someone else i want them to know more about this thing than i do i want to teach them other things they don't know i want to inspire i want them to inspire me you know um i want them to make me better i want that me to try to make them better and then those are your friends. Those are the ones that kind of stick around and you would do anything for them. Um, and then family is also priceless. Like family, you're here. You love, you hate, you you fight, you you make up. It's, it's that those group of people that no matter what you do, they're always on your side, you know. True. And then they'll the, be the first one, like, no, you ha- you're right. And then at the end, you're like, no, actually, I was wrong. Yeah, 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 no, you were right. <laughs> you were right. But I was like, no. I was actually wrong in this one. Like okay. you should have told me, like, oh, but we wanted to support you regardless. Like, <laughs> it's okay. Well. So, if I was to ask you what makes you happy, we're not too far away from all the things you just mentioned. Yeah, I know it's uh, family. My kids, like, definitely. When you have kids, I think it's a life changer. And you have three, mashallah. So do you? Yeah, and um, and I remember. I was never afraid of flying till I had kids. And then I was terrified of flying. And it wasn't about, you know, before I was like, oh, if I die, I die. You know, like, um, you know, inshallah, I did enough good to, to, to go to the good place. And um, when you have kids, your fear of dying is fear of abandoning them, right? And abandoning the ones you love and trying to make sure they're and, you know, as soon as the plane is turbulent, I start praying. I'm like, please, God, you know, like, I just, I, I need to be there for them, you know. And you you don't know that love till you till you get kids. It's it's amazing. And It's no longer about you, right? It's no longer about you. And my life since I've had them is no longer about me. So even when I travel, there's always, you know, if they're not with me physically, I don't feel 100%. I feel like 80 and I'm like, the other 20 is with them somewhere. Like, how oh, did they eat? Did they, did they wake up? Did they, you know, they have to call me in the morning. They have to call me before they go to sleep. I need to make sure, you know, 
I still, by the way, go to their room when they're sleeping and check on their breathing. You know, I still, <laughs> they're nine and, you know, seven and five, and I still do that because it's a habit. Um, and just seeing them happy. And it's a weird thing because they can drive you crazy. You're like, oh my God, just go to sleep. But as soon as they go to sleep, you're like, oh, I want, I want to wake you up. <laughs> I want to wake you more. Mind, right? It's like, yeah. Um, and honestly, it's, it's, and then it makes you appreciate your parents. You know, you have this stage where in life where you're like, you know, your parents are the whole world. And then you're like independence. You know, you want your own space. You want your own time. You want everything like your teens and 20s. And then when you have kids, you just, you know, you get it. And you're like, oh, my parents, you know. So and then giving them. Forgiving. They not, yeah, yeah. And then understanding them. Yeah. Because, you know, they were there. They supported you, whether you got it or you didn't get it, whether you misunderstood them, whether they tried, they assumed they were doing the best, you know. And it's, it's amazing what they do. And when you see them with your kids, they love your kids. Yeah. You know, like grandparents are just the best and the worst because they want to spoil them yes, and they yeah, don't yeah. care about the consequences yes. and all the candy and chocolate they give them and, and what happens to them and when you get them home. They're, they're there to spoil. Yeah. And I think it's a bit payback, right? It is. It's like they're they're trying to pay you back for everything you did wrong. That's what's going on. And, but yeah, and then it's, I think it gets you closer to them once you have kids. Um, you're a lot more understanding. Mm-hmm from when you leave the house until you get married there's a lot of distance yeah then when you have kids it brings you back it does it, it really does that's all you want to do you just want to spend time with them and you enjoy spending time with them and you understand and um it's it's yeah and and the thing is honestly i think if i lived anywhere else in the world i probably wouldn't have three kids i would probably would have stopped at once because one because you don't really have the support system but having kids in Saudi is amazing you have so many support systems. Yeah. You have friends. You have, you know, they're like, oh, you're traveling? I'm going to take your kids for the whole day. Yeah. You know, I'm going to do this with them. Tomorrow, I will have your kids. You know, I send them here. You know, like, I'll send my kids over. You know, like, that supports effortlessly. And we take it for granted. And I see my other friends, you know, who I met internationally in my, you know, different um, educational career and they're like, how are you dealing with three? I'm like, honestly, if I was living in London like you, okay. I would have probably stopped at one and a half, you know, like <laughs> not even. But it's it's you know, I, I think I, I can do my job because you have that support, yeah. you know, and and you don't feel bad and you know, they're off, you know, living, you know, having fun with their friends and and they get it, you know. And I tell them, I was like, like, why do you have to go there? I was like, why do you have to go on a play date? You know, why do you have to go to all these birthdays? Why can't I go for a dinner? <laughs> They're like, okay, you can go to your dinner. You can go see your friends. And then they see their friends more than me. <laughs> like they're always out. What's next for you going forward, your plans? What can we expect to hear coming out of um, the Culinary Arts Commission? There is so many amazing things coming out. I mean, we've been working so hard for the past few years. Apart from all the laughing, <laughs> we have been working very hard. No, honestly, it's um, we have culinary tours. We have you know Colon Bleu opening, uh, a lot of different things. That, you know the um, a lot of documentaries and, and and information that's coming out. You know with with books. I think we have ten books coming out this year. Um, we have a kid book. I don't know if I sh- I showed you that one. It's Aklinam in Medina. We're going to do it for all the regions, the 13 regions. And it's a beautiful book for ages 9 to 12. And it tells you kind of history about a dish. You have recipes. You can do the recipes. And it's per region. And you go with the characters. And it's kind of like a comic storybook uh, in Arabic. It's beautiful. And we even did a, a Saudi coffee toy set. And my uh, the concept was culture should be in everything, right? And my kids were playing with the um, kitchen set, you know, as kids do. And there was like the croissant, there was a pa- uh, pasta, and they're cooking pizza and all these different toys and a tea set. I'm like, why isn't there a Saudi coffee set? Why isn't there kleja? Why isn't there like shush? You know, why why don't we have these dishes so kids can play with? And we did a Saudi coffee uh, set 
where you can literally do in Najat and you can grind the coffee and you can all do all these different things and serve the coffee and and with the date and it's, it's quite nice to see kids play with it and and we were yeah. selling them in London we were selling them in London and we saw kids literally play with the coffee set amazing and Saudi coffee set it was beautiful and it's such a small thing one of the smallest you know initiatives we had but to me, it has a kind of trickle effect, you know. To support it, yeah. To get it embedded in their in their minds at that age. With the rest, with the hotels opening in Red Sea, there is sixty or seventy opening in the next five years. Yeah. Three in this year, Q four to this year. Uh, are you guys working with those hotels? Yeah. So we work with all the um, mega projects in the kingdom and definitely with regards to with the Ministry of Tourism, Saudi Tourism Authority, we're very close to them. Um, we try to work with all the other minist uh, ministries as well um, to push as much as possible. Um, with all the mega projects, uh, you know, the Red Sea, uh, what do they need with regards to hospitality, recipes, um, training programs? Uh, uh, how can we help them? What should they include? Um, you know, for example, a simplest thing is why do we have continental breakfasts and not a Saudi breakfast offered in hotels? You know, something we're working on. Why do we have this and not this? Why is it? Why are we serving chocolate on on the hotel beds and not date? Dates. You know, simple simple things. But these are the small touch points that you want a culture to have, and and it goes a long way. And we celebrated our national dish, Jadish and Makshush, which was amazing, and we have a huge campaign for it and. And just educating people and then about our dishes. And then we're going to have the 13 region just announced. So each region has their own dish to be celebrated. You know, it's, it's, it's nice. It's kind of like this introduction of Saudi. I remember when we went abroad in Lyon, in Syrah, and we had a big booth for Saudi. And it's the first time Saudi was participating in this huge event. And everyone comes to this event, like, what are you doing? They're like, they're like, you have such a big booth. I was like, we're introducing ourselves. You know, this is us. These are our ingredients. These are our recipes. These are our chefs. Um, they didn't know we had green pastures. They didn't know we had uh, farms. They didn't know we grew mangoes. You know, we grew bananas. We have all these different coffee farms and, and flavors and Down south. spices. Beautiful. And they would see these images and were in awe. They're like, we didn't know. You know, we assumed you're a desert. We assumed... You know, your food was bland. We assumed you didn't know how to cook. You assume, and they started these Michelin star chefs and star chefs, and you can see in their color, are going to the Saudi booth. And they just want to try the Saudi cuisine, and they come every day. And to me, that was the biggest compliment. It's not when they tell me anything. It's physically see them come every day to get another bite of, of what they tried yesterday or to try something else. New, and, new to them, right? This is all new to them. And they, di they didn't know, and we had... One of the best experiences we had also was in Saudi Feast Food Festival last December. And we had, we invited two Saudi chefs to cook alongside two Michelin star chefs. And they catered a dinner for three days and they designed the menu together. So there was a Michelin star chef and a Saudi chef. And the concept was done to, you host one dinner, you have a long table and it was called the feast. And you book a seat or two. You don't know who's going to sit next to you. Uh, and you share this meal. And this meal was designed by these two amazing chefs, a Saudi and an international one. And they had the conversation, you know, on the phone, online, different meetings. They had three days before to prepare and test ingredients and do this beautiful menu. And they were supposed to do, say, five dishes each. One did 13 dishes because the chef was so inspired about the ingredients. Another one did, I think, 10. They all went above what we expected them to do. Uh, one of the dishes they did was a filet of camel. We normally eat the whole camel. You know, we've never dissected it and had only the filet, and it was amazing. And he did it with a different sauce. And then the Saudi chefs had their dishes, but you couldn't tell the dishes apart. They looked like one cohesive meal. And after the dinners, I, I remember speaking to the Saudi chefs, and I'm like, Look what you achieved. Hmm. You were literally cooking alongside a mission star chef, world renowned, you know, and you were at the same level. You know, the mission guys aren't Saudi yet, you know, but you're at that level. It was amazing. 
Yeah. Makes me proud. Everything that you are doing day to day, month to month, year to year, the book that you made, the two, probably going to work on the third, getting the Saudi name out there to places like Lyon, places I can't even pronounce, Risa or Risa. Putting the Saudi flag up in places where they never saw it, culinary-wise, mm. makes me super, super proud to hear that you're doing what you're doing, honestly. Farah, Annie, you really need to be proud of yourself. Farah, I'm so proud of the team we have in the commission. I mean, they're amazing, the support we have from the ministry, from the minister, from the vice minister. I mean, I literally could not have done anything without the support. It's crazy how much support and backing they give you. And it makes it amazing to go to work, honestly. I love going to work. Does it feel like work? It's, it, no, it's fun. I mean, it feels like work because you're away from family. I think that's where I yeah. describe work. It's something that takes you away from family because it's, I love the people I work with. Uh, they make me laugh and uh, uh, inspire me and make me creative. And I, I hope I give them percentage of what they give me to be honest it's important to remember that I think with the commission we try to get everyone out on the field because sometimes you lose the focus of what we're doing where you're, you're you're working on the desk and you're not seeing the people you're doing it for and you're not out on the field we try to get everyone to go once with the research team because they see hands-on the interaction between the older generation how thankful they are that we're documenting the recipes and how grateful this one project we're doing means to them. And that they're so proud, you know, to be a part of it. And they're so proud. And, and they just thank the commission all the time. And to go and see them and see, you know, what they do and what they're contributing is, is very important. Because yeah. as soon as we lose that, lose the effect we have on the people, on what we're doing, then it becomes any other desk job. Mundane. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Second time we uh, we talk. First time uh, we we didn't film it, <laughs> and then we didn't air it. No. But thank you for coming to the studio. I know it's something we've been planning for a while, and telling your story. Um, I love how long the episode was. How long is it? I hope you edit a lot. Like you have to cut it down. People, the tension span are quite small. <laughs> close, close, except for those who will carry an interest in the subject, um, mm. and 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 maybe those who never knew anything about the culinary field, but because of your story, uh, they will listen to a lot of this episode. I hope they get hungry and order something Saudi. Last question. Um, for those new to the Saudi cuisine or Arabic cuisine or Saudi cuisine, if you can recommend one dish to someone to go try right now, um, Saudi dish, what would you recommend? Hmm. I honestly have a lot of favorites. So if it's something sweet, it's kleja. I think everyone knows the kleja to me is like the ultimate cookie. I've never had that. It is so good. And the first time I had it was in Gafim. It's a cookie? It's a, it's a biscuit and it's um, it's stuffed with uh, date syrup and a limon as with lumi. Yeah. And it's so good. It has this kind of tanginess, sweetness to it. And um, if, it's, uh, if it's salty, I... Uh, I always crave my father's sadiq, so something he cooks for us every now and then. It's it's more sentimental than anything, and it reminds me of home. Uh, and I think everyone needs that kind of memory yeah. to get them through like a tough day. Sadiq is more Riyadh region. No, it's uh, Jadish is it's, uh, central region. It's a broth, and it, the rice is extremely creamy, even if it doesn't have milk. It's in the way it's slow cooked. It's beautiful. You know, I could never get myself to go for Sadiq. I'd normally always go for the, I would always go for the normal rice. Okay. Even in Italy, the risotto. I, Let's have you over for the league one day. I'll try yours. I'll try your father's uh, <laughs> creation. <laughs> Thanks, Mayad, so much. Thanks. Really appreciate your time. Again, you make us so proud, um, you and what the 33 people in your team do. Thank you. Uh, and, and beyond that, and thanks for sharing the story. Wallah. Thank you so much. Much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you.